بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يسلح لكم أعمالكم ويخفل لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أعاذنا الله تعالى من نار جهنم Come to the third principle from the five major قواعد الفقهية There are many fiqh principles that the ulama of al-Islam have recorded for us and explained for us but as we've already mentioned five of them are the most important ones Today is one of the single most important. From the five most important ones, this one is one of the most important of those five. And if people don't comprehend it and they don't understand it, then they'll make unnecessary duress upon themselves, stress upon others. And that is the qa'ida that the ulama said, At-Taysir, awal mashakkatu tajribu, At-Taysir. Al-mashakka tajribu, At-Taysir. When things become difficult for the Muslim in his religion, the religion looks for ways to make things easy for him. The way the religion is, is that when things become difficult upon an individual, Allah doesn't want difficulty upon people. And the Prophet ﷺ did not bring a religion that makes things inherently difficult upon people. Now before explaining this issue and getting into some depth concerning it, it should be understood that in practicing the, the religion, there are going to be some aspects of difficulty. Those of you who have performed hajj, you know that Hajj is difficult. Hajj is not a joke. Coming to the masjid, as many of you have done, all of you have done, Salatul Isha, it's not easy. You have to make some efforts to come to the masjid. And I know many of the brothers who attend our classes on a regular basis, 
They are students in the university, students who are in college, high school as we call it in America. And these brothers make their way from Nichols, from Newtown, from all parts of Birmingham in order to be here. They have to catch the bus and then they have to catch the bus coming and going back. That's not easy. People walk from Alam Rock to the Masjid. People walk from different parts of Spark Hill, Spark Brook, and Small Heath, and they come to the Masjid. So there's a level of difficulty in that. We're not talking about that. This principle is talking about the difficulty that an individual doesn't have the ability to handle. The difficulty that is put on an individual that is not normal. It's above average. So the Qaida it says, Al Mashakatu difficulty. Tajlibu at In the deen, when things are difficult for you, the religion automatically wants to bring to you ease. And we mentioned this many times in previous khutub. And we tried to address many issues because this principle is so important. What happened the other day in France, it is a direct result of people who don't understand this principle. I don't believe everything that BBC has to say, Western media, mass media, I don't believe everything that they have to say. They're politicians, I don't believe it. I recall in Norway when the white man who was an original Norwegian and he was racist when he went to some island because Norway has a lot of islands for the people who are familiar with Norway as many of our Somali brothers are because they live there you can leave the main body of land of Norway and go to this island and that island and that island but anyway a racist white man he went to one of those islands where he systematically shot down in cold blood a number of young people who were on a camping trip. Some crazy number in the 90s or 100s. And he also blew up buildings in Oslo, the capital of Norway. I saw many people who were in Norway after that had happened. They came and they said, we're going to push back this violence and this hatred that this man did, who was a Christian, calling for white supremacy. We're going to push back what he did with love. And they brought roses and they made demonstrations and they were trying to show this is hatred and we want to love. We didn't hear the leaders of Norway declaring war. This is an act of war. What this man did to us is an act of war. Because he tried to kill, he killed some of our youth, as what happened in France. And he's against our way of life and what we stand for. We didn't hear none of that. Because that's the double standards of what we're dealing with today. And if the people who perpetrated this crime, if it is true that they did that, those Muslims, if they understood this particular principle, they would have never done something like that. Because it has nothing to do with the Quran, it has nothing to do with the Sunnah, and all it does is bring difficulty upon the Muslims unnecessarily. And it brings difficulty upon the community at large, unnecessarily. In our religion, in the deen of Allah, we're sitting and we're telling the people in Al Islam, the Quran and the authentic Sunnah of Al Mustafa, Al Mujtaba. Al-Mukhtar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is a religion that says, Al-Mashakkatu tajribu at Islam wants ease for all of the people. There is no ease in murdering people indiscriminately who are innocent and have nothing to do with your beef and your problem. There's no ease in that. They have no understanding of Al-Islam. And I repeat here what I said a number of times, Ikhwani, the scholars of Al-Islam, they said that out of all of the groups, all of the tawa'if, all of the jama'at in Al-Islam, there are many groups. 
There is the Salafi, there's the Ikhwani, there's the Tablighi, there's the Sufi, the Ubandi, there is the Naqshbandi, there are many, many groups. Even those who curse the companions. There are many groups of Muslims, as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My Ummah is going to split up into 73 different groups. And each one of those 73, they have subdivisions. There are a lot of groups in Al Islam. The single worst, evil, most harmful group upon Islam and the Muslims are the Khawarij. They are the worst out of all of those groups. And they never brought Al Islam and the people of Islam any good. So everybody has to make an effort not to be from those people, not to support them. I don't like the history of France as it relates to Islam and Africa, the land of my forefathers. They are criminals. The French are criminals. But that doesn't justify any Muslim going to France and doing what those people did. The Khawarij are the single most evil group that came out of Al-Islam. The Prophet said about them, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Whom? Sharrul khalq wal khaliqa They are the worst, the most evil creation and group of people. That's what the Nabi said. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Utaymiyyah mentioned that the Khawarij never, ever, ever brought to Al-Islam any good. Authentic hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for some of the ignorant people from our community. Rasulullah said that when the Dajjal comes, when the Dajjal, a Dajjal, when he comes, one of the group of people who will be assisting the Dajjal are the Khawarij. The Khawarij, along with another group of people, the Khawarij are going to be assisting the Dajjal. The Khawarij never meant for Al-Islam and the Muslims any good whatsoever. So with that being the case, we have to bring this to your attention that as a person who teaches here, I have my own personal views that are not always necessarily the same views as the administration here or this institution. When I speak, I speak for myself. Sometimes I disagree with you, I disagree with Others, my views are my views, me, me. Like I mentioned, I'm not happy with the history of France. What France has done to destabilize some of the poor countries of the world, the colonization of France was the single most evil colonization known to mankind, in my opinion. But although that's the case, in my opinion, no way, no shape, no form can a Muslim with his sanity support Charlie Hebdo or support what happened the other day where Muslims went and they did something like that. Not only is it not permissible, but you harm Al-Islam. You harm Al-Islam. Those people go, France, a sovereign country from the superpowers. They go and then they start bombing Muslims in the Muslim land after you do something like that, what did you accomplish? They kill all of those Muslims. What did you accomplish? You didn't put Islam forward by one inch. Instead, you put Islam back to the point where here in the UK, we don't have anything to do with what happened. We don't have anything to do with what happened. But there have been assaults that have been perpetrated on innocent Muslim women here because of what those people are doing. So I want to bring to your attention, Ikhwani, a principle in Al-Islam that's not connected to the dars, but because of what happened, it is my religious responsibility. This masjid, myself, other masajid, we should make our position clear, not out of fear of the Muslim community or the non-Muslim community, but it's our religion. There is something that I want you guys to remember. It is called al baraatu Al Juziya. Al Baraatu Al Juziya. It means partially separating yourself from your brother, from his action, the Muslim, from his action. 
You don't separate yourself totally from him. You separate yourself from his action. But nonetheless, he's still your brother. He's still your brother. He may drink khamar. He may be into molesting children. A'udhu billah. He may be an individual who murders someone. He may be a Muslim who is selling drugs. All of the big crimes that people are committing. You free yourself from the crime that he's committed. And you are not hesitant to free yourself. That's your religious responsibility. Don't acquiesce and don't placate the situation. Make it clear, Zeki. So I totally, absolutely, 110% free myself from, for an example, the Afro-Caribbean lady who was on the bus hurling abuses towards the Muslim lady. I free myself from her. Because she's my color, I don't support that. That's ignorance. And I'm free from what she did. Although she's from the daughters of the same ethnic group that I come from. But that is not going to allow me or, or let me gloss over the crime she committed. Free myself from that. I free myself, myself from the kufr and the shirk of my mother, my father, my two sisters, my aunties and all of them. I'm free of that. Although the blood that runs in my body is the same blood that runs in their bodies. And I love them. In this issue, our masjid, as a teacher here, the khatib, one of the khatibs here, I free myself unapologetically and without any, any hesitation from those types of actions that just happened the other day. It's not connected to al-Islam, not from close and not from far. There's absolutely no connection. There is a disconnect. That's called al baraatu al juziya Religiously, you have to free yourself from people who do crazy things. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam sent his companion, Khalid ibn Walid, and he was given the auspicious title, the laqab, the nickname of being Sayfullah. He was the sword of Allah because he was so serious when it came to putting the sword down. May Allah be pleased with him. But Khalid was not from the ulama of the companions. May Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet sent them off, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, and he told them, when you come to these people, you go in the land and establish the kalima of a tawheed. Khalid came to the people, may Allah be pleased with them, and he began to indiscriminately kill everybody. Khalid ibn Walid started killing everybody who was in the city. Men, women, children, the elderly, he just was dealing with the situation. His opinion was, let Allah solve the problem. Let Allah judge their situation. When the Prophet heard about it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came and he saw all of that, he said, Allahumma inni bari'u mimma sana'a Khalid. Oh Allah, I'm free. I'm free from what Khalid did here today. He freed himself from what Khalid did. Khalid ibn Walid, radiallahu anh. He freed himself. So in these days, when we see Muslim personalities go on TV and they're being questioned about this and they're trying to articulate, hey, yeah, we're not happy with what has happened there, but France did this and this. I think what has to come across very clear from every Muslim speaker is this thing is unacceptable in our religion. That has to be more clear than the other point of view. Hey, France, they create problems. Those people from France, their foreign policy, the way they are is a problem. That's important to get across. But given the choice, getting across, Islam is free from this, getting that across, hey, it's more important to get across to the public. Islam is totally, absolutely, 110% free from that. al baraatu al asliya No one should be hesitant about that in our religion. Whether it's this issue or another issue. Your relative, my relative, your people, my people. If someone does something from this religion that is not from this religion, we shouldn't have any qualms with freeing ourselves from that issue. So those people who don't understand this principle today, 
المشقت تجلب التيسير when things are difficult upon the Muslim then Islam came with legislation to make things easy for everyone because Allah doesn't want things to be difficult for anyone out there and what I'm talking about when we say difficulty unnecessary duress because being difficult is an issue that is nispy it is an issue that is relative what's difficult for me may not be difficult for you and may what may be difficult for me may not be difficult for the next person but there this this principle is talking about real difficulty real difficulty not eating not sleeping not having stability not having security being forced to do something that's beyond your god given ability the ability that allah azza wa has given the normal human being so this principle comes from a number of ayat in the quran and a number of hadith from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from them is what was revealed considering and dealing with the ayat of fasting there's some difficulty in fasting fasting is not easy i became a muslim in the month of ramadan and i was around people who didn't know the religion they told me i had to fast from maghrib all the way to past salatu tarawih and then when i finally ate after tarawih i was saying what kind of religion is this because they didn't know what they were talking about so when you fast in the month of ramadan especially as a new muslim it's not easy you never fasted in your life that's difficult but it's not difficult beyond your ability to do it in most instances so in the ayat of fasting allah azza wa mentioned yuridu allah bikum al yusr wa la yuridu bikum al usr allah wants ease for you and he doesn't want difficulty for you why was that ayat mentioned that ayat was mentioned that verse was mentioned because if you're traveling you don't have to fast if you're pregnant you don't have to fast if you're too old you don't have to fast if you're sick you don't have to fast al mashaqqatu tajribu wa tayseer difficulty automatically brings ease to you and your religion from those ayat and there are many the statement of allah azza wa jal la yukallifu allah nafsan illa wus'aha Allah doesn't burden any person beyond his scope. Allah doesn't burden anyone sitting out there beyond his ability. So the drama and the problems that are happening in Syria in El Iraq, Allah didn't put that on my shoulders to go over there to solve that problem. There's no ayat of the Quran, there's no hadith, there's no scholar, no one can come and tell you Allah said to you, "Akhi Amr, go over there and help the muslim world in freedom la yukallifu allah nafsan illa wus'aha allah didn't put a burden on you beyond your ability that's another one of those many ayat and they are many many from them what we want to share with you is a statement of allah ta'ala yuridu allah an yukhaffifa ankum wa khuliqa al-insan dha'ifa Allah wants to make light for you your burden and mankind has been created weak. Someone in this audience with all of these students that are here you look around mashallah someone here is the most strongest person here and I think he's probably the most strongest person here mashallah Allahu a'lam mashallah and someone here is probably the most weakest person and I won't choose anyone for that he'll get upset The point here is the strongest person from amongst us for an example we're performing Hajj and right now we have to walk right now from here all the way to city center and come back again there's someone from amongst us without any hesitation he'll pop up and he's okay let's do it and then there's another person hey do we really have to do that so that one who will pop up and he'll just do it that individual is weak He may have the desire to do something like that but he may not know other aspects of the religion that will make his life easy and the life of the people around him easy because he's young and experienced he's pumped up he's fired up he's lifting weights he's ready to go he'll pop up yeah I'm ready to go city center walk back and he'll do it 
And he's strong physically, but he is not. He is not strong in his deen. He doesn't know the religion. So the strongest person from amongst us is still da'if. He's weak. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ da'ifa. Mankind has been created in a state of weakness. So this ayah shows Allah wants to make takhfif. He wants to make things light and easy on you. Tolerable, manageable, doable. He doesn't want to make you an individual who you're looking at some aspect of Islam and the way you see that thing and you envision that thing that's in front of you, it is like a mountain that's about to fall on you. If someone said to you, go over there and move that building from this place and put it over there, you'll see that request as well as the thing in Islam that you are required to do, you'll see as one is the same. Allah didn't put that on people. He made it light upon these individuals. He mentioned in the Quran, subhanahu wa ta'ala, مَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيَجْعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ حَرَجْ وَلَكِنْ يُرِيدُ لِيُطَهِّرُكُمْ Allah doesn't want to make anything difficult upon you, but he wants to make things easy so that you can be purified. This ayat was revealed about At-tayammum. At-tayammum. We have to make wudu. We have to make wudu for every prayer. What about the people who are in the desert, the Serengeti Desert? What about the people who are in Alaska and it's really cold and using water to make wudu? If you use that water, it's going to give you frostbite. I mean, when you use the water, you pull it out, it will freeze your fingertips, your fingers, and they'll fall off. Like if you were to dip it in nitroglycerin. If you dipped it, someone come and just pop it right off, just like that. Islam is telling him, make wudu out there in 65 degrees below zero temperature. No, this ayah said, Allah wants to purify you. So if you can't use the water because you need it to drink, because there's no water at all, or because you're living in an environment that has some serious adverse situations going on, then all you have to do is make tayammum. That's all you have to do is make tayammum. Made it easy for the people in their religion. He said in Surah Al-Hajj, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ مِنْ لَتَأَبِيكُمْ Ibrahim. Allah didn't make things difficult upon you people in your religion. This is the religion of your father Ibrahim. This is the religion of your father Ibrahim. Allah didn't make things difficult to difficult upon you in your deen. In your deen. Khwani, I don't have time to make clarifications about everything that I say. But I have to stop here. I don't want anybody here to think that when you are sleeping at Fajr time, now, Fajr is pretty early, that your alarm goes off, you open your eyes, you say, okay, five o'clock, quarter to five, slam is easy. Abu Usama said that, and you go back to sleep. We're not talking about that at all. Slam is not that easy. That's not what I'm talking about here today. So don't anybody walk away saying that. Abu Usama said, religion is easy. Do what you ever what you want to do. I never said that. We're talking about the undue and necessary duress that people find themselves in situations. If you find yourself, you new Muslim, any of you, in a situation that is really difficult, then Islam didn't make things difficult upon you. And this is another issue of when like we see some people who never smile, they're never happy, they're always looking upset and crazy. We say, what's wrong with you? The religion is easy, relax. What's wrong with you all upset like that? This principle is from that as well. From the statements that we present to you as well is the authentic hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealing with the Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, the last two ayat of the surah, Allah will ta'ala mention that the believers say, رَبَّنَا لَا تُعَخِذْنَا إِن نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا Oh Allah, forgive us, our Lord, if we forget or if we made a mistake. وَلَا تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْنَا and don't put on us a burden like you put on those people who came before us from the Bani Israel. And 
أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم على قوم الكافرين and 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 make things easy for us and don't make things difficult for us because you 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 are our protector you you Allah the prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said when a person reads these ayat that Allah said I I will do what you're asking me to do don't make things difficult for me don't put on me a burden like you did on those who went before us what was the burden of those people who went before us their burden was if one of them made a mistake about something that they did, they had to kill themselves to make toba. In order to make pure, sincere toba, they had to kill themselves. The Japanese, Aki Khalid, there's something in their culture with these guys who are criminals. They're the mafiosos from the Japs. They have tattoos and stuff like that. They live by honor. They have their boss, their chief, whatever, whatever. If one of them does something that brings upon himself shame, he'll take a knife out in front of everybody and cut his stomach, his intestines out. He'll take a knife and chop his finger off in front of everybody. And that's a sign of his sincerity and his toba. Slap doesn't want that from you, chopping off your finger. Someone come and you have four fingers. We say, what happened to you? He said, I made toba in Allah. He said, toba in Allah. Hey man, you don't know the principle. Al mashakatu tajribu taysir. You're not a Japanese man. That's not our religion. So Beni Israel, if they made a mistake, if they did something, Musa will come to them and say to them, "Faktu al fusukum darikum khairu lakum in dabari in dabari ikum." Kill yourselves. That is better for you in the sight of your body, Allah. And then they, the sincere ones, will kill themselves. And the insincere ones will say, I'm not doing that. But that was bad on them in the community. We don't have to do that. All we have to do is make toba. How do you make toba in Islam? You say, You stop doing that thing. You don't go back to it. You took someone's stuff. You give it back to them. And that's it. And you live your life. And you can become from the awliya of Allah. As for killing yourself, that dua was... Don't put on us a burden like you put on the people who went before us. Where difficulty, al mushaqqa we said in this principle, al mushaqqa to tajribu at Difficulty brings ease. al mushaqqa in their religion, it was a goal and an objective. It used to be something that they had to do. In our religion, not at all. It was lifted off of us, totally, absolutely. So that hadith of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam goes to show, it prove, indicates clearly our religion is making things easy for the people. From that is the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he described the religion of Islam. He said, "In the Deen, yusrun, walan yushad the Deen ahdun illa galabahu, fasadidu wa qaribu." This religion is easy. And no one goes overboard in the religion except that he makes things difficult for himself and he will be overcome and overwhelmed. So do the best that you can do to get close to the bullseye. So if someone wanted to do everything that Al-Islam was telling him to do, Islam told you to pray the five prayers today. And Islam told you to pray all of the nawafil. And Islam told you to pray the Salat al-Witr and Qiyamul al layl And Islam told you to visit your relatives and to enjoin the good and prevent the evil. Islam told you to give sadaqa fi sabirillah. And Islam told you to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And Islam told you all of these things. If you try to do all of those things, you're going to be overwhelmed. So the companion, Sufyan ibn Abdullahi, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and may Allah be pleased with him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, laqad kathurat aliyya sha'airu deen. The religion has become a lot. There's a lot to do in the religion. So tell me something. Shorten it for me. Tell me something I can do. He said, la yazaru lisanu ka rutban min dhikrillah. Out of all these things that I have to do, there's a lot. There's too much. I can't do everything. So tell me something I should focus on. Out of all these things, the one thing, he said, don't allow your tongue to become dry from the dhikr of Allah. Be a person who makes all of those adhkar, 
morning, night, going in the mess, you're going out in the mess, shit, when you eat, when you drink, when you go to sleep, when you put your clothes on, learn the adhkar of al-Islam. But the point here is that the man acknowledged and the prophet heard what he said. The religion is a lot. Just tell me something I have to do. Out of all of these things, what's the one thing you would advise me to do? Have dhikr. Have dhikr. Read the Quran. Make your salat and read the Quran and so forth and so on. So there's a lot. So the religion is easy. Anyone who tries to do everything in this religion, he will be overwhelmed. He will be overcome. Overwhelmed. Do your best and try to get to the bullseye. Do as much as you possibly can do and do it well. From those hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is when he used to send his companions out to give da'wah in Allah to the non-Muslims of France and to the non-Muslims of the UK and America and Belgium. He used to tell Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu anhum, he used to say to them, Yassiru, wala tu asiru, bashiru, wala tu nafiru. Go to these people and make things easy for them and don't make things difficult for them. Give them glad tidings and don't run them away from the religion. Make things easy for them. Hey, say la ilaha illallah and believe in that and you'll go to Jannah and don't make things too difficult. Give them glad tidings. You're going to go to Jannah. And don't give them, don't be running them away. You'll never get into Jannah. You mubtadi, you kafir, you from the tawagid, you're this, you're that. Hey, that's not our religion. So when sending people out to go give dawah in Allah, he used to tell the du'at from his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, make things easy for the people. Don't make things difficult for the people. When he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal, who was the first out of the three to go to al Yemen, he told Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he said to him, Fattaqi makarim amwalihim. When you take the zakat from these people, Mu'adh, when you go and they embrace Islam, they say, La ilaha illallah, Mamda Rasulullah. They, give, they make salat and they give zakat. He said, Take from them zakat, but leave along the best of their wealth. Don't take the best of their wealth. Everybody here, he has some wealth. And in his wealth, some of his wealth is more important to him than the other aspects of his wealth. His trainers that he has for the last three, four, five years, he doesn't wear them hardly unless he's going to do some gardening or go to a janazah and the rain is coming down. That wealth, he doesn't care about that. But his brand new jacket, his brand spanking new clothes, his brand new furniture, the things that he has brand spanking new don't touch that. He has a brand new mobile phone. Don't touch that. Take the wealth that he has. That's not the thing that his heart is most connected to. That's ease. Because he's going to have a problem. He got a brand new phone yesterday. Brand new phone. And the person comes and says, you have to give me that phone in Zakat. He's going to say, man, I ain't giving you my phone in Zakat. And then there's going to be some problems. The prophet told him, don't ask for his phone. Don't ask for that. Stay away from the best of their wealth. He has camels, he has sheep, he has this and that. Don't take the biggest, strongest of his camels. Don't take that. Don't take the one who has one leg neither. He's just barely moving around. But don't take the best of what the man has to offer. Because why? If you do that, the natural human being is going to say, Really? Are you serious? That's the ease of Islam. And Ikhwani, there are too many hadith. I'm just giving you a few, just like, I'm just giving you a few of the ayat of the Quran. The companion said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he told the people, Lola an ashuku aw ashaku ala ummati la amartuhum bis siwak in the kulli salatin. If it wasn't for the fact that I thought it would be difficult for my ummah, I would have made them all use the miswak at the time of prayer. But I thought it was going to be difficult. He said, if I didn't, if I didn't think it would be difficult, I would have ordered them. I ordered them to make wudu. I ordered them to make salat. 
I ordered them to give salams. I ordered them to do many things. I would have ordered them to make miswak. So I'm just asking you guys. Anybody right now? Can you show me a hand? Do you have a miswak with you right now? Anybody? Put your hand up, Akhi Yusuf. Yusuf from Ghan is the only one who has a miswak. And may Allah put that in his mizan of hasanat. But the point that we're making is, where are our miswaks? Where were they at? And can you imagine if our salat wouldn't have been accepted without that miswak? None of us brought the miswak, although everybody here, these little brothers here in the corner, everybody knows miswak is from the sunnah. And they will cause your salat to go up. And Allah loves that miswak. And the Prophet used to love the miswak salat. Everybody knows that. Where's your miswak at? But he said, I knew it would be difficult for them. And if I were to give each and everybody here a miswak, you're going to lose it before the class next Tuesday. Because we can't keep up with them. Can't keep up with them. But that's the ease of Islam. Al-mushakka. Lola an ashakku. Al-mushakka tu tajribu taysir. He used that same word. Lola an ashakku. If I didn't think it was be it would be difficult, I would have ordered them. But he knew it was going to be difficult. Your law was not forgetful. When Allah over 1400 years ago, he legislated this religion, he knew what our lifestyle would be 1436 years after the hijras. Hard to keep up with a miswak. Not only in the UK, in Mecca and Medina. It's hard to keep up with it. So that is one of the many proofs of this issue. Our religion makes things easy for the people. Lastly, Khwani is the hadith that the companion said about the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anas ibn Umarik described him and he said, Ma khujira Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bayna amraini illa ikhtara illa ikhtara aysara huma ma lam yakun ithm. The Prophet was never given a choice between two things that he had to choose. If two things were presented to him and he had to choose one of the two, he would always choose the easier of the two. He would never choose the more difficult one. That's his sunnah. Anytime something is presented to you and you have a choice, where if you choose this or you choose that and you won't get in trouble, you have a choice. It's up to you. Which one do you want? He would always choose the easier of the two. And that's because his sunnah was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a sunnah making things easy upon the people. Based upon this, al-imam al-suyuti, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that all of the rukhs in al-Islam, all of the rukhsas that come in our religion, they come under this principle. A rukhsa is... When the religion gives you the ability to take advantage of a concession. You don't have to fast in the month of Ramadan if you're traveling. You can shorten your prayer if you're traveling. You can combine your prayer if you're traveling. Ruksa. If you're sick, pray sitting down. If you're, if you're in a situation where things are difficult for you, you can get and take advantage of the rukhsa. So that's one of the words you guys should put into your vocabulary. I'm going to mention it, and I want you to mention it back after me, inshallah. And as we always say, this is not the dhikr of the Sufis. This is the dhikr so we can just learn our religion. So I'm going to say rukhsa. Okay, in unity, we've got to be united. Rukhsa. you got to say rukhsa. Good job, Ahi. What's the word? Okay, the principle. Al Mashakatu Tajribu at Taysir. What's that, Ahi? Tell us, say it, Ahi, Abdul Qadir. Al Mashakka Tajribu at Taysir. Tajlib, Tajlibu. Good job. Al Mashakka, things that are difficult, they bring ease. The Prophet said in authentic hadith. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam Man shakka Shakka allahu alayhi Man shakka ala nasi Shakka allahu alayhi Anyone who makes things difficult for the people 
Allah will make things difficult for you. Anyone who makes things difficult for the people. Because that's not our religion. They make things difficult on our children. The child is going to school during the day and then he has to go to the duksi, to the madrasa for the Quran. And then he comes home, he does his homework. And then he has to eat and go to sleep. And every day, it's like that, every day. And at no point does he get some reprieve and some raha, relaxation. You're making it difficult. You're going to blow a fuse in the kid. At some point, the weekend, you got to take that kid out and let him just enjoy himself. Party time. Let him do what he wants to do within the framework of Al-Islam. Can't be a person who's always rough and tough on the people. So Imam Al-Suyuti, he mentioned, Rahimullah Ta'ala, that from this particular qa'idah, this principle, every single rukhsa comes from it. And if you look in the arkan of al-Islam, al-Khamsa, in each rukn from the arkan of al-Islam, we have this ease. The shahada la ilaha illallah. When the Prophet came in Mecca, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at the beginning, the Muslims didn't declare their Islam. They were quiet. Because you can lose your life if the Quraysh knew you were Muslim, they would kill you. So they used to gather in Dar al Arqam secretly. And no one would know that they were there. And the Prophet was the strongest one. He was strong, but it's difficult. And he used to tell his companions, don't profess your Islam, don't give da'wah like that. In the Salat, in the Salat, in the Salat, I already mentioned. The issue of wudu tayammam, making things easy for you. If you can't pray standing up, pray sitting down. Can't pray sitting down, pray laying down. Showing your prayer. All of the arkan and the zakat and the zakat. No one has to pay the zakat who doesn't have the ability to pay. No one. And those of you who have the ability to pay is only 2.5%. That's all. It's 2.5%. So that's all. It's no more than that. It's easy. It's not difficult. Number three, stay away from the best monies of the people. The psalm in Ramadan. The pregnant woman doesn't have to fast. The woman who is giving her baby the milk from the mother, suckling the baby, doesn't have to fast. Traveling, you don't have to fast. You're old, you don't have to fast. You're sick, you don't have to fast. Even those of us who are here right now, you are a person who is enjoying good health. May Allah give all of you brothers afia and longevity and good health. You're a regular person. But in the month of Ramadan, you got a headache. And it's not a migraine headache. It's a headache that you don't like. If you want to keep fasting, you can keep fasting. But if you have a headache that's really causing you problems, a toothache, you wait and you got an operation and they're going to do this and that and you're hurting somewhere, you don't have to fast. Just make it up late on. The whole religion, our kind of Islam are like that. Hajj. You don't have the money, don't make hajj. You don't have a mahram, don't make hajj. The way is not safe, don't make hajj. When you make hajj, you can make the easy hajj, al-ifrad. Where all you do is make hajj. You don't have to slaughter an animal, you don't have to do anything else. The whole religion is this point. So how in the world are people going to come and do things where the whole dunya is watching what we do and call that Islam? Wallahi akhwani, it is ignorance that is compounded. People who don't know their elbow from their ankle bone in this religion. They don't know. And as a result of that, they're doing things. And then the non-Muslims look at us. And then they open up the door to do all kinds of crimes against us in the name of what you did. And that's why you young brothers here, Wallahi, I'm not against the Shabab of our community. We need the Shabab just as much as we need our shiuch, and just as much as we need the people between the shabab and the shiuch. Everyone has an important and integral role that he plays in the further development of our community. But the shabab, the youngsters, are the ones that we are most fearful for. Because the khawarij, who do they attract? They attract the mentality of the youngster who doesn't know anything. And he's making decisions based upon his emotions more than anything else. And in this arena, the emotions are not to be followed. They're not to be followed. All of us should have sentiments and emotions. Like 
I don't like to see Muslims getting oppressed and getting killed. It's not nice. The Jews, are, the Zionists, are still killing the Palestinians from the days of Hajj, and nothing has let up. It's just that we're not seeing that. We don't like that. But that's one thing. As for those emotions allowing me to do something crazy, it's not our religion. There are a few things, Ikhwani, that this particular qaida are really important in. A few issues. Specific issues that al-mashakkatu tajribu al-taysir. That the scholars of al-Islam have wrote extensively concerning these six or seven issues. Number one, al-mashakkatu tajribu al-taysir when it comes to traveling. When it comes to traveling. Because he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as-safaru qit'atu min al adab Traveling is a piece of punishment. When you travel, you're being punished. You're being punished. He said, يُمْنَعُ أَحَدُكُمْ مِنْ طَعَامِي وَالشَّرَابِي And that's because you were prevented from your food that you're used to in your drink. You are not sleeping in your bed. So it's adab in and of itself. But you have to travel. You have to travel. Everybody here is going to travel. We have to travel for our work. We have to travel for our relatives. We have to travel for knowledge. We have to travel for Hajj and Umrah. Everybody here is going to travel. Everybody. It's part of the human experience. Can someone who never traveled put your hand up? If you never, ever, ever traveled, you were born in Birmingham and you never left Small Heath, put your hand up. All right. How many of you traveled in your life? Can I see? Can I see? Everybody has to travel. So there are books written about the etiquettes of traveling because the Prophet wasallam, his religion didn't leave anything for us to guess. No, there are etiquettes. What day to travel, what's the best time to travel, what to do when you travel. All of those issues, choosing the mir, make a dua to the people that you're leaving, they make a dua back to you, so many things. So al mashaqqa Tajribu taysir in the issue of traveling, especially. Number two, in the issue of al-marud, in your sickness, when you're sick. When you're sick, if an individual prays all of his nawafu prayer, and he fasts Mondays and Thursdays, and then he becomes sick, as a result of that, he doesn't do the nawafu because he's not feeling well. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah will write down for him the rewards of everything he used to do when he used to be well. Because it's only because he's sick that he's not doing those things. So if he was in good health and he used to do this, used to do that, visit the people, that, 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 Allah will give him the reward for what he did when he was sick. Number three, al-ikrah. Al-ikrah means... uh, um, when you're compelled to do something. When you're compelled, someone comes to you and he says, uh, hey, disbelieve in Allah or you're going to lose your life. That's difficult, losing your life. Islam said, make it easy. Okay, disbelieve in Allah. If you're compelled to do something, taking uh, riba, taking uh, car insurance, anything that you're compelled to do, if you don't do that thing, you're going to be dire consequences that come as a result of you not doing it, then Al-Islam made it easy for you if you're really compelled. And there are many examples. And it's not just the non-Muslim against the Muslim who compels you. The Muslim lady is married to a Muslim man who wants her to have relationships with him in the month of Ramadan. If she doesn't do it, there's some serious circumstances. So she does it not liking it, not wanting it, but because if she doesn't, this tyrant is going to cause her problems. Any of those issues like that. Islam is not telling you to destroy your life. That's number three. Number four from the issues, and nisyan. And nisyan, if a person forgets. You forget something, hey, it's not your fault. I forgot to make Salatul Fajr. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Menama, and Salatin, oh, Nasiyaha. Anyone who sleeps on a prayer unintentionally and he overslept or he forgot about it, then just let him pray it when he remembers. 
He doesn't have to do Toba. He didn't do anything wrong. The pin is lifted off of three people. And one of those people is an naim Hatta yastayqid. Is lifted off of the one who was sleeping until he comes out of his sleep. Number five, a jahl. A person really doesn't know he's ignorant. And this is why in giving da'wah to our relatives and giving da'wah to the Muslims and dealing with the Muslims, we shouldn't be rough and tough with people because many of the Muslims just don't know. So relax in giving da'wah because al-mushakkatu tajri bin taysir. They don't know. They're ignorant. They don't know. So as a result of their ignorance, they do the things that they do. We do the things that we do. So we have to relax a little bit. And there are some other issues, but they're kind of like deep and complicated, especially during our time. Like a nux, a nux deficiency. If a person is a slave, we don't have slaves today. If a person is a slave, then al Islam came and made things easy for him. Because a slave has to take care of his master. So he can't pray when his master wants him to do something. Can't go to hajj when his master wants him to stay and serve him. Can't get married if his master wants him to do this and that. So we're not going to get deep into that issue. But similar to it is a person who has a job. He has a job. That job doesn't allow him the flexibility and the freedom to go to pray Five times a day in the masjid. Okay. And mashakatu tajr bin at No problem. Islam is not telling you to go pray five times a day and you have a job. Because if you tell the boss in the job, I must pray salat al dhura asr al maghrib in the masjid. And if I don't pray, I can't work here. He said, okay, go. You can't work here. I get somebody else to take your place. And then you sit unemployed forever because no one's going to hire you like that. That is for the everyday life of most of us. Take it easy. In this city of Birmingham, in Mecca, Medina, on Friday, everybody, all the Muslims, during the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa everybody went to his masjid, and they prayed Salat al-Jumah in his masjid, Salat al-Eid behind him. But that's difficult for us to do that. Everybody is going to go to one masjid. No one masjid in the city of Birmingham is going to accommodate the whole community. No one masjid. Green Lane is one of the bigger masjids. Accommodates a large number of people. But it can't accommodate everybody in Birmingham. So what's the principle? Al-mashakkatu tajribu at Some of you go to that masjid. Go to that masjid. Go to that masjid. Go to different masjids. It's the ignorant youngsters. And we heard this da'wah before. And all of the other masjids should be closed down. What is this? We're against the... What are you talking about? The religion. The religion allows all of that. Yes, the prophet didn't do that. He didn't do that. He had his masjid. And he had masjid Quba. Masjid Quba used to close down. And everybody came to his masjid. So you can't come and tell the people of Birmingham. Everybody has to go to one masjid. What, what masjid is that? Which one? So it's the people who don't understand and comprehend these principles who come with these far-fetched, far-out claims. This is innovation, that's innovation, that's wrong, and this is wrong, and so forth and so on. So this particular principle, Ikhwani, is one of the most important principles in Al-Islam, in Al-Fiqh, from the Qawaid Al-Fiqhiyah. Don't make things difficult upon yourselves. He told the Imam, مَنْ صَلَّ بِالنَّاسِ فَلْيُخَفِّفْ فَإِنَّ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ الْمَرِيدِ Anyone who prays, make it easy for the people. Lighten your prayer. Behind you is the sick, the elderly, and someone who has something to do. He has to go to work. He has to get home and go to bed. Take it easy. The religion makes things easy for the people. So don't make things difficult for the people. Okay, Ikhwani, we'll stop here, inshallah. We'll have two more principles, and from this particular principle, other principles come. But we're not going to deal with that. We're not going to get into that, inshallah. Just want to deal with the ru'us al-aqlam. If I can't shay, you guys can ask right now, inshallah, if you have any questions. Hal indakum shay? Tafadu ya akhi amr. About traveling? Concerning the person who is traveling, does he have to shorten his prayer? Allahumma naam. 
he should shorten his prayer. And if he doesn't, he is making a mistake. It's not optional. He should shorten his prayer. And that is because in the beginning of Islam, as our mother Aisha said, may Allah be pleased with her. She said at the beginning, prayer was two rakat. Salat al-Zuhr, Salat al-Asr isha It was two rakat, and that's all they prayed, two rakat. And then as time went on, and look at this, al-mashakkatu tajribu at taysir They were not used to praying. So when Allah instituted prayer, he made it two rakat, make it easy for them. Khamr is haram. But when Allah made it haram, he made it haram. Step by step by step. Fasting was difficult for them. So it wasn't wajib. Whoever wanted to fast Ashura, fast Ashura. Whoever didn't want to fast, don't fast. And then Ashura one day became wajib. And then the fast of Ramadan. Taking it easy. So in the beginning, the prayer was only two rakat. Salat al-Dhuhr was only two rakat. Asr, Isha, two rakat. That's it. Salaam alaikum rahmatullah. Salaam alaikum rahmatullah. And then she said that Allah extended it and he made it four. When you're muqeem, when you're in your city, a resident, and he kept it as two for the traveler. So it was never four during the time of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amr, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never prayed dhuhr, asr, isha, four rakat ever while he was traveling. He always shortened it because in the religion there's no dhuhr, four rakats and you're traveling. There's no asr, four rakats and you're traveling. There's no isha, four rakats and you're traveling. It's up to you to choose. Do I pray dhuhr only two rakats and that's it? Or do I pray dhuhr two rakats and asr two rakats combined? It's up to you. Do I pray asr two rakats and asr two rakats during the time of asr or during the time of dhuhr? That's what's up to you. As for should I pray two rakats for dhuhr or four rakats of dhuhr? There's no such thing, Ummat al-Islam. As a musafir, a traveler, praying dhuhr for rakat, asr for rakat, isha for rakat. There is not in the religion. Do you guys understand that point? Do you guys understand that point? So if I die and you die, you stand before Allah with jail, you say, that's what Abu Usama said. Because that's from what the ulama of al-hadith and the ulama of al and is clear in our religion. It's clear in our religion. Aisha said, the salat at the beginning was two rakat. And then Allah extended it and made it four. For the one who was muqeem, two for the one who was traveling. Good question, Akhi Amr. May Allah give you barakah and put nur in your face, in your life, in your grave, and marry you to four nice wives. Go ahead, Akhi. <laughs> he got red, man. Fadal, <laughs> Akhi. I didn't get the last part. Gyms, gyms. The Prophet ﷺ was naturally strong, uh, given to him by Allah. And um, this is one of the characteristics of all of the prophets and the messengers, all of them. And uh, Surah Al Baqarah, Surah Al Baqarah. In the story of uh, Talut and Jalut and Dawood, uh, David and Goliath and their king Saul. Uh, the ayah said that in the last of Awalikum, Wajalahu Bastatan Fil Elmi Wajasit. Say it again. What's the beginning of the ayah? In Allah, astafahu alaykum wa zaadahu bastatan fil ilmi wal jism. Bani Israel came to their prophet and said, make for us a king. We want a king. You're the prophet, make for us a king. 
He said, verily Allah has put over you as a king, uh, Saul. Allah has put over you as a king, Saul. They said, how is he going to be a king over us when we have more children than him? We got more money than him. Their prophet said, Allah has chosen him over you and he gave him a lot of strength in his body and he gave him knowledge. So all of the prophets and the messengers, they were strong. They weren't overweight. They weren't tired. They weren't weak. And the reason for that is in dealing with their own people, they have to be able to deal with their own people. And then with dealing with giving down with Allah and protecting the religion and jihad and all of that, they have to be strong. So the prophet was traveling, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from al Medina, and he was going to Tobuk, which was very, very, very far away, very, very far. And it was one of the most difficult battles because it was really hot. It was hot, really hot. So on the one horse was Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Usama ibn Zayd. And the three of them would alternate the prophet rode first and when his time came to get off the two of them said no ya Rasulullah stay up there don't worry stay up there he said to the two of them he said you two don't have more ability than me to walk I'm stronger than you I can walk and I need more of the reward than you by me walking and allowing you to get up I'm going to get the reward for getting down I need that reward more than you so the fact that he told them, I can walk more than you can walk. Shows that he was strong. So all of them were strong. All of them. That's one of the characteristics of the prophets and the messenger. And the times that they lived in used to help them. They didn't have processed meat. They didn't have all this sugar. They didn't have all of that, uh, um, uh, these um, chemicals that we eat. They didn't have the lifestyle we have, being up the nighttime, all of the stuff that we do is just not healthy for you. White bread, white sugar, white, white, white is a problem. It's just brown sugar, brown bread. <laughs> so if a person wants to get strong now, let him do MMA and lift weights and do cardiovascular. And let him work out with a group of brothers and get strong. So that if anybody step to him, he can handle his business. Anybody else? Anybody else? We're going to stop here, Juan. Tfadiyah. At-tayammum. At-tayammum, ya akhi. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in that surah, in Surah Ali Imran, fatayammamu sa'idun tayyibah famsahu bi ra'us, famsahu bi aydikum wa, famsahu bi wajuhikum wa aydikum min. When you make a tayammum, wipe your faces, and your hands. So some of the scholars said as it relates to the face, you do that, you do your face, you do it again, and you do the hands. Some scholars say you do your hands up to here. But the important thing is that uh, you take the dirt. It can be the dirt off the wall, because there's some dust on that wall. There's some dust here. But it's always better to be actual dirt that you can see, because there's no dirt, there's no doubt about that dirt. There's no dirt about that doubt. Or no doubt about that dirt. So the individual takes it like that. And he does it like this. He does it again. And he does his hand like this. Or like this. And that's the tayammum. And then for the next salat, he has to either do it again or make a wudu. He can't save this the way he would save his wudu. Okay? My man. Tfadu ya akhi. You're from Dublin. Bissalama wa tawfiq.
The situation has is wasi. It's up to you. Bala linsan wana nafsi basir. It's up to you. If you want to stay at home and not come to the masjid at all, you can make maghrib at maghrib time with isha. Combined and shortened. If you want to stay home and you want to make maghrib and delay it until isha time, then you could do that. If you want to come to the masjid and pay maghrib and go home, come to the masjid, pay maghrib and isha, you can. If you want to pray maghrib in the masjid and then go home and pray isha, two rakat, you can. If you want to not pray maghrib at all and then come to the masjid for isha and pray maghrib and isha, all of that is up to you. All of that is up to the musafir. All of that is up to you. And this is what this principle is all about. It's making things easy for you. So the person will come and say, you can't do that. You have to do this, this, that. He'll never give you any proof why you have to do this, this, that, that. It's up to you. What works with you as a musafir? Are you with your family? You're not with your family. You're in a hotel. What? It all goes back to you. All of that. As we mentioned. No one can come and tell you what's easy for you. Okay, Achi? So you're going to Dublin when? Tomorrow. You have family here? In Birmingham, you don't have family? Oh, because we were going to take you to the restaurant, the Momos or something like that, okay? We're going to take you to Momos. Okay, Akhwani, nakhtafi bihad al qadr, and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to uh, give us the khayr of the dunya and the hereafter, make things easy for us in our deen and our dunya. Akhi, how you been? You okay? Good to see you once again. Allah yahfadakum. Wa sahalallah alaykum amurakum. Wa salamu alaykum rahmatullahi wa barakat. Namshi, Akhi Zaki, intalakna. Hey, Yabina, ya Akhi. Assalamu alaykum. Are you cast all right? I'm so